Stigmata. Norwich, England. The year 1144. Sister Sabina decides to take the shortcut through the woods. She never normally goes in the woods at Muzzled Heath. Why would she? Even by day it's dark and full of stinging creatures. And now the light is fading. But then she mustn't arrive late. They warned her the last time. And that's why on this day, unwillingly, she takes the direct path through the woods, remembering as she makes her way through the darkest trough. Stern Sister Magdalene's warning. And as she follows the gloomy path, dim shapes take on imagined forms. The devil crouching there with two long horns turns out to be a bush. The wolf lurking at the foot of the tree is a shadow. Her steps quicken. It will soon be too dark to see. But as she spies the end of the path through the last avenue of trees and starts to walk faster, her foot kicks against something solid. She skips over it, but rather than hurry on, she turns round to see what it was. In the tenuous light, it looks like a child. A dead child. She stares at it for some minutes before shaking herself out of her stupor, crossing herself and hurrying wordlessly on, scurrying past the woodcutter, who she nearly bumps into at the crossroads. Henry stares at the panicking nun as she runs by him, trembling and gasping then carries on his way, dragging a small sled of logs behind him. Now he reaches the dead child. The nun must have seen the creature. That's why she was running. But she said nothing, didn't even warn him. He bends down to inspect the corpse. There's something in the lad's mouth. He takes it out. Soon he decides to turf the logs off the sled and take the boy's body into Norwich. He wonders if, by doing that, he'll be accused of murder, but puts his faith in God that this will not happen. Then he thinks of the nun. God may not even be necessary after all. The nun had seen that the boy was dead before he arrived on the scene. She'll speak up for him. He'd just have to find her again. And, being a nun, she's the best kind of witness. She can't lie. But why did she flee? Nuns don't lie and nuns don't kill children, so she can't be the murderer. For now, Henry takes on the sad and clumsy task of dragging the stiffening body over the stones and reeds to the city walls before they shut the gates. After pushing through the gasping, fainting crowd that has gathered to heed the hue and cry, Wilson and Elvira recognise their son William immediately. Despite the scratches, the mud, the torn shirt, the boots, but nothing between, there's no doubt it's him lying before them on the stone slab of pavement. All the while, more crowds gather around in the square, all anxious to know who the victim is, who the murderer, and where and when and how. The boy's parents tell the assembled crowd how their son William was bought but a week ago. Not even a week. Last Monday it was. Bought? A voice asks. Aye, he, he was apprenticed at the start of the week. They gave us three shillings. People gasp. You sold him? We apprenticed him. We didn't sell him. He was going to be taught how to be a cook. It was the cook that took him. Aye, the big man. There's a murmuring. Some of the castle officials arrive and begin to look at the body and to ask questions. Is it murder? One official nods his head slowly, indicating a bruise on the base of the lad's neck. Where did you find him, Henry? He asks the woodcutter. On the road out of the woods. And where is the cook? Some people indicate the house some furlongs distant, but nobody imagines he's to be found there now. Come, says one official to another, and they set off in the direction indicated. The milling crowd are left to look at the body, now with a young soldier set to guard it with his pike staff. What's happened to his mouth? There was a teasel in it, Henry tells them. That's what made the scratches. A comb? Aye. 
Someone had gagged him with it? I know not. The Jews, cries out a voice at the back of the crowd. Heads turn to face the source of the voice. You all know it, says Ralph, a huge man with a huge beard and a bellowing voice. You all know it, but you won't say it, he bellows. Careful what you say, Ralph, admonishes another. Ralph points a fat red finger at Wilson, the dead lad's father. You say the cook took him. You mean Samuel? Aye. Where? Where did he take him? Ralph, shouts another voice. You're a blacksmith, not a prosecutor. Where did they take him? Roars Ralph. They came to see me last Tuesday, says Agnes. And you are Wilson's sister? I am. Why did they come to you? By now the corpse is all but forgotten, and the crowd has unwittingly aligned itself into two competing factions. People are beginning to huddle around Big Ralph and his accusing finger. What's all this now? the justice announces as he sweeps into the square with his entourage. Voices begin to shout at once, competing versions of events. Let Wilson's sister speak, roars Ralph above all other voices. People wait to see what happens next. She will speak when it's her turn, the justice says. Now I shall turn this matter over to the... I followed them, the dead boy's aunt speaks up, unbidden. Heads turn to her. I followed them to see where he was living, as we were not told his whereabouts. I didn't like that. What do you mean? The justice asks. The cook brought William to me to collect some things of his that were normally kept in my house. What things? It matters not, Ralph shouts. Tell us where they went, the cook and the boy. To where did you follow them? To the Jew's house. A silence in the crowd. The justice whispers something to an aide, who hurries off into the centre of town. Guard, says the justice to the soldier, stay here. Let them touch nothing until the sheriff arrives. This matter is for him to decide. And with a glance at the blacksmith, he and his group move off in the direction of the aide. Big Ralph surveys the scene. He is a hand taller than anyone else. Broad-shouldered. He senses they are watching him, waiting for him to make another pronouncement. But he said all he needs to say. He knows. They know. So he says nothing and silently leaves. More people drift away as more drift towards, wanting to see the corpse. There they gather and hypothesise and suspect. Before sundown the corpse has been taken away on the back of a cart and Henry de Sproston has his sled back again. He's happy as he won't be blamed for the murder. Not one of the townsfolk had even hinted at the possibility. They know him for a good man, not a fighter, not a troublemaker. God will see that right is done. He was right to have faith. On Easter Monday, the body was buried. They decided to inter it at the place it was found in a shallow makeshift grave while the matter was discussed. The very next day, it's dug up again and buried properly with the appropriate rites. In the meantime, all the known Jews of Norwich are confined in the Sheriff's Castle by order of the Sheriff. Sheriff de Chesney knows what is being said about the Jewish families. He's seen the writing on the walls. After some weeks, when tempers have calmed, they will be let back out into the normal life of the city. But they will never again be looked on in the same light. Two years after these events, the boy William's body is exhumed and examined once more. Then it is transferred to the monastery garden, where the monks begin to revere it. On hearing the story, the Pope sets the wheels in motion for him to become a saint, a martyr to the Jews. No Jew is tried, by the way as they are subject to their own ecclesiastical courts. 
It's been this way since King William's time, when the first Jews came. The year 1150. Found on Easter Saturday, buried on Easter Monday, and then again the next day. He looks over his notes at his scribe. The scribe motions with his head that this is all correct. Later transferred to the monastery gardens. Another nod of the head. Then it is there that we shall begin our search for the truth. Six years may have passed, but therein lies the challenge, scribe. We submit ourselves into the hands of the Lord. The scribe understands the instruction, gathers his things and follows Thomas out of the door. This investigation shouldn't take long. It's a simple question of interviewing all those who'd seen the corpse and accumulating the evidence like piling stones up to make a wall. It's easy enough to believe in God in a monastery garden in summer. The monks are witness to the changing of the seasons, and now, when the earth gives forth her bounty, their praises are heartfelt. The abbot has shown the visitors the gardens, and they have been impressed. Now they arrive at the grave, and stop to gather round. We cannot open the gardens to the people, Brother Francis explains. There are too many. They trample our strawberries, he chuckles. But occasional visitors of repute? He bows slightly. May we exhume the body? Detective Thomas asks bluntly. There is no need, is the reply. Two years had passed when we unearthed the pure lad from where he lay slain, and we had time enough to gaze upon him then. And? Francis does not understand at first. Ah, and uh, yes, you would like a description? I must know everything I can if I am to write his life. Of course. Did you personally see the body when it was brought here? I did. The stigmata? The abbot hesitates. There were scratches around his head and mouth, and blood on the palms of his hands. Another pause. Yes, says Francis at last, as if nails had been driven through them. Tell me about scratches around the head, as if made by brambles or even harder metal points, he says. And you saw all this clearly as the body had not decomposed. It had not. It was this that made us suspect his saintliness. Of course, Thomas stops his line of inquiry, breathes in the fresh air, looks up at the clear blue sky. Did you get all that? The scribe nods a yes. Thomas turns again to the abbot. You heard more stories during these two years, he suggests. The abbot casts a glance at his accompanying high-ranking fellow monks. They look away. I cannot tell stories of what the Jews did as, as, as well as the Jews can tell it themselves, he suggests. Which Jews live here still? None, says one of the monks. They are not Jews, they are conversos. They are afraid with the, the Crusades and that. But we war against the Saracens. Saracens, Jews, pagans, heathens. Francis' voice trails off, leaving the sound of birdsong to echo through the monastery walls. With whom shall I best speak, then? Theobald of Cambridge. And where will I find him? At the end of the main street you'll find the house off to one side with a corral. That's where he lives. The view from the second floor shows the extent of Theobald's lands. The animals are well kept and people can be seen working the fields and the yards. Theobald offers them mead as they seat themselves at his large oak table. What can I tell you? The office. I have told it many a time, but I hear you are to write the truth down in a book. 
The young boy is a saint known to Rome. He must have his hagiography. Aye, Theobald laughs as he pours drinks. His story was a part of what brought me here. Thomas looks at the scribe with furrowed brow. By this you mean that you were not here when he was slain? Oh no, continues Theobald, as if nothing could be of less concern. He's been putting the uh, I was in Cambridge story around for so long now. Rose, he shouts to his wife, bring beats, and thumps the table. There's no reply. Where the devil is she? So, Thomas returns to the only matter that interests him. You did not see the body. No, I've been to the grave, he adds, as if that makes up for it. What are you striking at, says his wife as she appears in the room. Bring meat for our guests, he says. She looks the guests over with disdain, then hurries out of the room again. We are looking for information about this case, Thomas continues, and the monks sent us here. Of course, he says. I'm the one who knows what the Jews get up to. I used to be one, you know. He leaves a pause as if this information were surprising, as if he were not known as Theo the Converted around here. Theo, who will look after your money while you're away fighting in the Holy Lands. Rose enters the room, lays a loaf of bread and a platter of meat between the men on the table and stands over them. One by one they each take a slice and put it to their mouths. Pork! exclaims Thomas, munching with satisfaction and delight. And salted just right, he adds. The wordless scribe is also tucking into his repast. Once Rose has seen her fare going down well, she feels she can leave the room and leave the men to business. And what do the Jews do? Thomas asks as the three break bread together. What do the Jews do? Theo mulls over the question, as if he'd never considered it before. What do the Jews do? I'll tell you what the Jews do. And he leans towards them as if shielding the news from others, though there are no others to hear it. Every year, in a city called Narbonne in France, the heads of the Jewish families meet to decide who it shall fall to this year. Who shall what fall to? Theo chews on his meat some more, and takes a sip of mead. Mm. Of the crucifixion, he announces. And so, it seems, according to Theobald, the converted, once every year, the Jews meet in the south of France to draw lots. The losers of the lot must perform the unpleasant task by divine decree. Six years ago, in the year 1144, it had fallen to the Jews of Norwich, and it was they who had had to do it. Do what? As the men chew, they hear how, in order to one day regain their holy land of Israel, the Jews must take a pure Christian boy and sacrifice him as Christ to save themselves, just as Christ himself was sacrificed to save the Christians. What? It is their law, the ex-Jew explains languidly. With a look to his scribe saying, remember this, he asks Theobald to give details. In this way they hear how the Jews take one pure Christian child each year, tempt him with luxuries and promises, treat him well for a day or two and then begin the torture. He is strapped to a cross in the manner of our Lord, where his head is shaved and nails driven into the skull to represent the crown of thorns. His sides are pierced, he is forced to drink vinegar, and finally nailed to the cross while being spat on and insulted. The scribe is drinking in every word, committing them to memory. This is excellent copy. We may have a bestseller on our hands here. When Theobald finishes his description, Thomas looks at him in silence, trying to convince himself of the truth of these tales. Good, he says at last. He motions the scribe to stand with him and accompany him to the door. There's uh, Elijah as well, Theo tosses after them. He was there. He, he's known as Paul now. The Fuller, you know him? Another converso? Oh yes, uh, well, he's clean now. 
They take their leave and the ex-Jew closes the door behind them, still with half a mouthful of salted meat, and make their way down the stairs, past the sty where Rose is scraping food off plates to feed the pigs. She looks up at them wordlessly, frowning. Is it worth talking to the other Jews? This first one seems to know enough. Thomas lies in his tavern bed and wonders. The easy thing would be to tell himself he had enough evidence already to write his life of William, but that would be slothful, would it not? The story must be thorough or Rome will be displeased. So, the following day, from a sense of duty, Thomas does the rounds of the ex-Jews last houses. He hears from one how there was a fight over how to dispose of the body. He hears from another how his father, on his deathbed, had confessed to taking the body draped over his horse to the place in the woods where he was discovered. And a serving wench, but an old Christian, this one, not a, not a Jew, also tells him how she saw the Jews proceeding into the woods with the dead lad atop the nag. All in all, the day turns out better than he'd imagined. This would seem to be enough evidence for the telling of the tale. But one day on, as he lies once more in his creaking bed, the Inquisitor is still unquiet. And this night the thought comes clearly to him. He needs the word of someone pure. No converso or serving wench. A credible witness. He sits up in his bed. We must interview the nun, he says. This time they use horses. The convent is further from the centre of town than the monastery. They arrive as scheduled after the midday meal and are ushered into the office of the Mother Superior. About William, she says. About William. What do you want to know? What does Rome want to know, is the question. And what does Rome want to know? Everything, says Thomas, and sits back in his chair. The nun's power play does not work when confronted by an emissary from Rome. We want to see the nun who found the body. Mother Superior's lips tighten. Who informed you that there is such a nun? Henry de Sprousen, Thomas spits back. Before he died, he saw a nun rush past. Everybody knows it. She was frightened she'd seen the body. He thought he'd need her testimony to escape blame himself. But it wasn't necessary, so she was never found. However, it is necessary now, and so we must speak with her. The head nun looks at the two men with even greater suspicion. No nun here has ever talked of such a thing. Have you tried other monasteries? None are near enough, he holds firm. Then he remembers. Nuns cannot lie. All he has to do is ask the right questions. You say that no nun here witnessed the scene. I say that no nun has ever talked of it. Ah, here is the opening he wants. But it is possible they saw and never talked. Is it not? <sighs> the Mother Superior sighs. I can let you speak to Sabina, she says at length. But I fear it will be of no use. She has not uttered a coherent word in six years now, since she returned from the woods. Good, Thomas nods. And this coincides with the time they found the body in the woods? It does, Mother Superior pronounces unwillingly. Show us her cell. I'll call her, the chief nun says, and rings a bell. An assistant enters, and she in turn is sent off to fetch the poor, dumb creature. Sister Sabina looks incredibly young. So, six years ago, how old or young would she have been then? He doesn't ask. Instead, she's seated opposite them, and the taller man asks her about that night. She doesn't look at them, her gaze flitting mainly into the upper corners of the room, as if seeking out succubi in the cobwebs. I know this is difficult, Thomas reassures as best he can. But it is your duty to help us. Obedience, remember. Not a word. 
we will ask you some questions, he goes on. No reaction. Thomas glances at the scribe before continuing. Did you see the body of young William on the night he was murdered? She looks at them as if not understanding the question. You remember? The young boy you found? She flinches. You saw him lying in the woods, he reminds her. On the ground. Now she looks directly at him. A good sign. What did you see, Sister Sabina? She begins to moan. Did you see scratches on his body? Was that a nod of the head? What else? She's staring at him now, lips tight. Did you see the blood on his hands? Nothing. No reply. Like when our Lord was crucified, did you see the blood on the palms of his hands? Was he bruised? The stare is interrupted by a lowering of the eyes. This also seems to confirm Thomas's words. After a minute of nothingness, of silence interrupted by the buzzing of a fly, Thomas asks, Have you anything more to say? As they leave Norwich for London town, Thomas and the scribe ride at a leisurely pace pleased with the sense of a job well done. The church towers of East Anglia recede behind them and the dusty road to the capital opens up ahead of them. I feel we shall be well received for our labours, Thomas mounted on his fine white horse says to the scribe, a little lower beneath him on his inferior nag. They trot happily along. We have learned from this, have we not? Thomas asks. The scribe nods. When pursuing the truth, we must have need of, um, of what, scribe? Of perseverance. Very good. And if we are to have perseverance, what must we have for our strength? Faith, my lord. Indeed, faith, I like that. Maybe we could insert that at the end of our story. Perseverance needs faith. Yes, remember that. And off they go, carrying their life and miracles of St William of Norwich to old London town.